Uh, what we want to like to ask everybody, how was, I you know this week was a little bit more uh, intense than the other weeks. How, how was it trying to keep up this time? It took a lot for me. I, I'll be honest with you. I was I looked at a few and I was like, okay, it's kind of hard to do this. Yeah. So I did finish it. I mean, it was it, it was a lot of text this time, but yeah. I mean, it all goes together. So, it's, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> how about everybody online? How'd you guys do it this week? I know it was a little bit more text uh, than than previous weeks. Yes. 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 Granny. <laughs> That's all right. We're going to have a break soon. You can refresh. Right. We can refresh. Right. We can refresh. Um, but all right. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, so uh, thanks, everybody, for joining today. Um, we're just glad to be back. Um, this has just been just been great for us. Um, I know this is the first time we've had just the, the in-person experience, so we're just so delighted with that and just hearing the feedback, especially with being able to share, but also other people sharing at the same time versus my wife and I would just be talking. And for, for those online, my wife is here today. So she's joining us. So y'all know she's the better half. Um, but uh, <laughs> but um, but yeah, so this is the first time we've just really been doing it. So this has just really been a blessing to us. And so um for those that it is your first time, um, I'm Eric Patrick. I'm the lead pastor here at Harvest Ministries. Um, you know, we're essentially wanting to do that. We want to harvest ministries where we are. And so um, I, I share in previous sessions how we like to um, prepare, plant, pour, and produce. And that is just to prepare the soil, make a welcoming place, plant the seed of Jesus Christ, pour water so we can now have discipleship opportunity, and then um, produce good fruit. And so Bible study is a great opportunity to pour water for us to grow spiritually over and over again and um if you remember from last week i believe we went through where the farmers uh sowed the seed and he was like and then he just goes to sleep and then he wakes up and after a while the it's grown into something there's a harvest and it's just like god grants the increase there's literally we don't even know why grass grows in certain places that it's growing in. It's, it's just there um and that's just god in in his providence and, and what he can do and so uh so today we're going to be in week five. I'm going to go ahead and just pray us in. And uh, I know it's, it's quite a bit, so we'll just get right into it. Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, today. Thank you for allowing us just to come together another week, allowing us to give uh, give you praise another day. Um, we're grateful for the air that's in our lungs to breathe. We're grateful for um, just the opportunities to be able to engage with other people, um, those that we can see in person and those online. Um, and we just pray that today as we go through Mark chapter five and some of chapter six, that it is just a, a wonderful experience, a time for us to um, not just to feel convicted, but to really feel uplifted um, to see how Jesus continues to move, maneuver um, throughout his earthly ministry and also to um, send out his disciples as well. So we're just praying for a great time today and we pray all these things in your son Jesus name. Amen. 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 This year. So for a um, recap of week four, um, we started with uh, Jesus, his mom and his brothers were looking for him. And Jesus was actually in a group of people. He was probably in some, he was probably in a house and it was just like a little small setting, kind of like what we're in today. And he was, they were saying, hey, like your mother and your brother's outside. And he was just like, you know, those who do the will of God are my mother and my brother. And we talked about the will of God being there's like a sovereign will where God knows things that are happening around the corner. But then there's also the will of command where how do we follow God and to say, how do we come alongside exactly what he's doing? And we use an example of an actual will. Um, if, somebody, if, if I have a will and I were to pass away, my kids might not know what is to come, but I do. And there might be certain stipulations that come along with that to say, hey, here's how you can fulfill to get those things from a will. And so how do we just come alongside to ultimately receive God's promises that he has um, uh, granted to us. And um, we really went, dived into the sower, the seed, and the soils. And so we really talked about the different types of soils. Um, you have the, the, um, the beaten path where basically it's kind of like a walkway that people have created and the birds just come down and, and swoop it up. You have uh, the, the rocky soil where there's a, a little bit of soil, but then there's, there's the rocks beneath it. So that soil cannot actually take root and grow. And the sun will actually scorch whatever is trying to grow, and it's just going to die off. 
from that you have the thorns and the thorns can actually grow six to eight feet tall. So that means that there's some time that goes into that, but the thorns can actually, um, uh, I guess it's, it's strangle, if you will, um, the plant that's trying to grow there. And so if you think about your grass, if you have weeds in your grass, they just knock everything out. Like it just, it messes your whole grass of whatever you're trying to do. And, um, and they grow a lot faster, a lot higher than anything else that you have. And so that's what's happening. And the last is a good soil. It's just a soil where, hey, here's where fruit can actually be produced. And we saw that in this progression of the four soil types, that it actually, it's actually harder to get to the good soil. Um, if you want things to grow, you actually have to do more work than a weed that just grows on its own. And so we actually get to see that opportunity um, in there. Jesus talked about letting our light shine. Um, you don't put a lamp under a uh, under a bed or under a, like a table. You put it on a lampstand. We want to make sure that our light shines in the world, especially in society today. There's a lot of things that are out there where it's just it's just darkness. It's just trying to take over. It's trying to be those thorns and just to, um, to strangle us. But we say, hey, we're a light and we have to let our light shine. And with that light comes great responsibility. Um, we're going to see that today with uh, Jesus and his disciples where, hey, here's a new responsibility now to be sent out. And this is a there's a, a, a higher um, there's just a higher duty that you now have as a follower of Christ. Um, we talked about a mustard seed as well and how that even tied back into the different soils because a mustard seed is really small, but it can grow into a very large tree that can now house birds. And those same birds are the ones that go on the unbeaten path that can pick up the seeds. So even though there's something that can, we, we think about the faith of a mustard seed as something that is good, such as a tree that's growing, there can be bad things that can come in. And so nobody's perfect, you know, no, no family's perfect, no church is perfect, no school is perfect. Like there's nothing that's perfect. You can try to do the best that we can, but there are things that are going to kind of come in and try to deter the path. And then lastly was Jesus calming the storm. You know, they were going to the other side. His disciples were like, um, you know, the storm came and Jesus was asleep. They're like, hey man, like, don't you see what's going on here? Like you over here just sleeping on the job, like literally, and we're out here perishing, like water's in the boat, they're trying to get out, and we know that there were fishermen in the boat, so that means that it had to be a pretty bad storm. It wasn't like somebody like me who doesn't know anything about weather like that, that would be just like, oh, this is bad, and it could just be a drizzle. They were like, no, this was a pretty bad storm, and so um, Jesus was like, hey, um, where's your faith, and so he, peace be still, he calmed the storm, and they just kind of went on from that, and so that brings us into where we are today, um, I'm not really going to be because of the length. I'm not going to be able to read all of the days, the, the text in there. Um, but just as far as like an overview, I'll be able to go through that today. So we're in week five on day one, and this is covering um, uh, verses one through 20. And so um, it talks about how they came to the other side in the country of Ger Gersophanes. And this is now a Gentile region. So we've seen how they were in these, these Jewish regions, but now they're going into a, a Gentile region. And I like to even think of this as, this was the, the fulfillment of going to the other side. We just saw how Jesus told them, hey, we're gonna go to the other side, a storm came, and this is an actual, they got to the other side. And I know that might seem like a small thing, but I think it's important to know that uh, God shows up even in the small things. There are things that we probably just don't even, we just go through our daily daily routines, daily tasks, and we don't even think, thank God, hey, I get to brush my teeth today. Like that could be, we could be a man with a withered hand and not be able to do that. And so I think that we have to be noticeable that God is in the little thing. So they got to the other side and now this is on the east. If we think of the Sea of Galilee, they were on the west side of it. Now they're on the east side of it, just for some kind of like geography with that. Um, and so when they got there, there's this a man, they call him a demoniac or a man that was demon possessed. And there were a few things that this man was doing. Um, he was kind of just like walking around just aimlessly, essentially. It said he lived in a tomb. And this was actually a tomb. It was like, if you think of like a cemetery with a tomb, there were men or, or I guess even women for that matter, where if they were um, needed asylum outside of the community, whatever was going on, they just weren't in their right mind. They would seek refuge in these tombs. And so they would kind of live outside of the normal way of living for everybody else. And so he was doing that. Um, and, and I believe it's in Matthew, it mentions even that he was naked, that he wasn't clothed. 
and he um, he was um, he was not in his right mind. So here are three things that's happening. He's kind of wandering around in this. He calls it mountains or hillside. Really, sometimes when the Bible says mountains, it's really just more of like a hill. It doesn't mean like like a Mount Everest kind of a situation. It's just something that we can just kind of climb up. Um, but he was wandering around. He was naked. And he was out of his mind. And um, I think that this is uh, we we see this really redeemed. So as you go through this specific passage. Jesus um, cast out these demons. He put them into the swine. And later on, we see three things. The man is no longer wandering. He's sitting. He's no longer naked. He's clothed. He's no longer out of his mind. He's in his right mind. And I didn't pick up on this at first, but at the end, in the last verse, when, um, uh, when Jesus is telling the man in the last two verses, go and tell your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. Um, and verse 20 kind of reiterates that when I was looking in a different translation, it had the word things plural. And I was thinking like, well, he, he just passed out this evil spirit. Is it plural because it was more than one? Jesus asked the man, what is your name? And he said, my name is Legion. And Legion is just a military reference, meaning like 6,000 men. That's all that, that means. And so there were just more than one. It's not necessarily that there were 6,000, but we know that there was a lot of them in this man. And, um, and, and so he's telling them the things that I've done for you. And I was just like, what does this mean by things? And that's when I saw that, oh, that's what that is. There were three things that this man was doing. Nobody could, could contain him. They said they couldn't subdue They couldn't subdue him. He was breaking chains, he was breaking shackles, but he was wandering around, he was screaming, he was out of his mind and, um, and he was naked. And so Jesus did these three things to help him. He brought him back to his right mind. He clothed him. And I'm even thinking just in this setting, like, like, how, how long did all this even take? Like, what, where do these clothes even come from for him to clothe this man? If they're like at a tomb, you know, the man came up to him off of the water, like they just got extra clothes. I mean, I know they were traveling in the boats. Did they have like, like some luggage with them or something like that? I don't know what was going on, but they clearly clothed this man. And maybe they even gave them clothes um, off of their back. Um, we'll see in, the, uh, in, a, in a bit how Jesus was telling his disciples about don't take two tunics. So sometimes men would wear like, Sometimes you have like an undershirt, like a tank top on, and then you can have like another shirt on top of it. So sometimes the men would wear two shirts. So maybe it's possible that they just gave them the shirt off of their back and they had like another shirt under it. That's kind of speculation on my part, but it's it's very possible. Um, but those are the things that happened for this man. And so I was like, wow, like Jesus did so much more than we think. It wasn't just casting out the evil spirit, but it was, it was so much more than that. And sometimes I think that um, we, we just we focus on one thing and there's so many other things that he's done for us within even that one thing. So if he's healed somebody, well, what else now comes from that, um, that we can see how he's really just, just worked. And so, um, so we can see these are the things that Jesus did. Um, this is actually the first time that we've been reading that Jesus tells someone to go and tell somebody else. Up until this point, Jesus has either, it's been demons that he's cast out and he tells, he doesn't tell them to not talk about him because he doesn't want a bad, a bad rep to talk good about him because other people will get confused because they're going to be like, wait, we know your reputation. You're an evil spirit. You're not good. So whatever you're saying can't be good. So he told the demons to not say anything and pretty much everyone else. And I think it was, either, I think it was the leper. He said to not say anything, but the man went and still did it anyway. And everybody else that he helped he just said like, you're healed. So like the paralytic, you know, pick up your mat and go home. The man with the withered hand, like it was always just, just like, just go home. So this is the first time that Jesus actually helped somebody and then said, now go and tell other people. And the reason that this is, is because they're in a Gentile region. Before they've always been in these Jewish regions and he's been dealing with the Pharisees. He's been dealing with the scribes. He's been dealing with the religious elite who are combative to him. He's now in a place where they don't really have a presence like that. So there's not going to be as much competition with him. So feel free. Go ahead and tell these people. I mean, if these are the Gentiles at this time, you are the lost of the law. So go ahead and tell them um, it's going to be it's good news for them at this point. And so I think that that was that was like that's a key shift right here for Jesus to say that. And, you know, I wonder what were his disciples saying when like, did he just tell that man to go tell people? Because all of this time, he's not once said anything about telling people about what he's done for them. And, and so this is a very pivotal moment um, um, in, in this passage and in, even just in the scriptures up until now. And um, just kind of added in more on with this evil spirit. This word implore was like used a lot or like beg. 
Um, adjure was another word that was used. So uh, in another translation, the word implore was used like four or five times. And every time it meant like to beg of somebody to do something. So like when they begged him to like send them into the pigs. But the first time when it says in verse uh, verse seven, um, you, you do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God, I adjure you by God, do not torment me. Um, this word adjure is implore but it's actually trying to do it from a posture of strength. So this is the, the evil spirit saying, I, I command you almost, or you need to um, agree or take an oath that you will not do this. Like, don't torment me. They're trying to pose a position of strength. Now, mind you, this is Jesus. We see the outcome from it. They don't have that type of strength or authority to do that. But all of the other times that we see the word beg or implore is from a position of, of weakness or subservientness where, hey, can you just please do this for us? Can you do this for us? And so that's a shift that we see even with the spirits. And when it says, um, when it says um, you do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God, at the, in this culture, if you were to call somebody out by name, like that was meant to be a position of strength as well. So for them to call Jesus by name, they were saying like, oh, like we got the upper hand here because I'm calling you out like in front of all these people. But we know that that just that wasn't the case. And Colossians 2.15 actually uh, talks about Jesus really defeating all of these things when he died on the cross, how he defeated death and all these evil spirits and everything is just no match for him. We see it in his earthly ministry, but what his work on the cross is actually was said, everything is just it's a closed case now for good. Um, uh, so as far as for the pigs, why do you guys think that they chose the pigs? And maybe what was even the significance of the pigs in this case? Well, pigs were unclean anyway. Okay. Pigs were unclean. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's like the slime. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, the, the little nine lives or whatever it is that you give to cats and dogs. You know, yeah, they, yeah. Like, they didn't have all the bones. They had sloth. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so because of that, I think it's the uncleanness. The, yeah. The yeah. And we saw when it said it was about 2,000 pigs, they all went out. And um, this actually 2,000, it, it was all of them. Um, like I said, another translation says it entered all the pigs. So this was a very big economic portion of this community. And so when we got into when we get into where the her the herdsmen fled, or or the herdsmen were telling everybody what had happened for them, it was like you just messed up my business. Like if I'm if I'm like a personal trainer and you just you just told all my clients like working out is not good for me. Like y'all just go eat whatever you want to do. You just got rid of all my clients. Like, what am I supposed to do? I'm going to feel some type of way about that. And they did. So they told everybody what happened and they were just upset. And that's why they were telling him to depart from the region in verse 17. They were like, look, man, I, now I got to recuperate. How am I get? I got to get some more pigs now for, for my business to thrive and for me to make a living. And so th this is a great picture of do we choose like things of the world and money and wealth or are we choosing Jesus? And, and they, they chose the opposite. Um, and in verse 18, it says, and he was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon, the man who had been possessed by the demon begged him that he might be with him. This is a great depiction of our testimony because it, at this point, we know the man was demon possessed. They even called him legion, but he's no longer legion. They're gone. So how come he doesn't get a name? his identity is still the man who had been demon possessed. He went from the man that was demon possessed to the man who had been demon possessed. That's still how he's being identified. But I think it shows a shift for his testimony. Like, man, that's the man that was demon possessed. Like that's his testimony now. And so how do we own that? How do we actually say, okay, this is who I am. This is how Jesus has actually saved me and come into my life and, and for the better. And now to try to own that. Now, clearly I'm sure the man did have a name, but as we can see here, I think that that's why they said that. And when he begged that he might be with him, this is actually saying like he wanted to come alongside him just like the disciples, because in uh, chapter three, verse 14, um, this is when Jesus, when he actually named the 12 that were to follow him, he said, and they were to be with him. And so for this man to say, hey, I want to be with you, he wanted to be a disciple, but Jesus already chose his 12. Now, I'm not saying there weren't other people that were following around, but I think he wanted to be like in the upper echelon. 
And I wouldn't be surprised if because of this kind of a miracle, he probably felt like he could skip the line a little bit. But Jesus was like, no, you go back. Your work is to go home and tell everybody what to do. And so his home was the Decapolis. And so Decapolis just means 10 cities. And the great way for me to, to think of this is where we live at up here off of uh, 380. We got Crossroads, we got Aubrey, we got Little Elm, we got Savannah, you got all these different places. But most people just say, I live off of 380. Like that's the Decapolis for us. Like instead of saying all these different places. Now, if you live in this area, it's easy to tell somebody I live in Savannah or Providence Village or wherever. But if somebody is in Oklahoma, you know, you might, be, well, I live, well, I guess you won't say 380 to them, but people more so in Dallas, like you can kind of say that because most people have heard of 380 and they know what that means. And so that's kind of what the Decapolis was at this time. Um, so, so we know about uh, the people in the town were asking Jesus to leave was because of the business sales and we know the unclean spirits from the pigs. Was there, was there anything else from this, this day or from this passage about this demon possessed man that really kind of stood out to you? When you talked about, you know, more Jesus, it's not just the one you know, gift or blessing he does, but more stones and things made you think of, you know, the part about where you teach a man how to fish, you, mm -hmm, give him mm -hmm. fish, you teach him how to fish. You know? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. I don't know, I think I, I was just trying to think of the significance of, it's like when you said, this is where Jesus told him, yeah, told the man to go out. Like and tell others about him, mm -hmm. and just like the other times, he, he didn't want them to talk. But this person, as you mentioned, he's going away as the man who was possessed, but, but he's still speaking about Jesus when he did. So I don't know if that just kind of blows my mind a little mm -hmm. bit. Where like, who was Jesus thinking? Why was that such so different that this man can speak about you? Who was even possessed? So obviously, he was around the Gentiles, mm -hmm. even though they had that different culture. They still knew of him. They would have known that this person was, hey, he was even possessed. Yeah, yeah he had a reputation, about, I'm sure. Yeah, right. he's coming and telling us about Jesus. Is, is that because Jesus was trying to test them, right? To test their hearts for them to be open, meaning that some would, some would, you know, approach mm -hmm. and go, well, this is Jesus. This is, you know, what the prophecy says. This is whose tongue. This is Messiah. And then it would basically separate those who truly, truly believed and mm -hmm. those who still were like, yeah, I don't know about this. Yeah, I don't know. This yeah. seems like there was a test there coming mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that I still, I mean, I understand. Yeah. And I think some of that also is with this being in a Gentile air region, um, there wasn't, like I said, there wasn't going to be as much combativeness with it, right? So before, I think there was also a level of safety that came into this. If Jesus did something for someone, and if he were to say, hey, go out and say this, well, Jesus is already being ridiculed himself. So now I'm putting your life at risk if you're just going out here saying all these different things. I'm sure like the leper, like my wife was just like, I wonder if he was still alive after like a week or two or something. Like, like did people come at him, even though he was healed, were they now attacking him in a different way? Was he being ostracized in a different way? Because he was speaking something that was blasphemy. I mean, people literally were telling Jesus, this is the work of Satan that you're doing. And so I think there was a level of safety that actually came with that. But now that they're in a new area that that they don't have to have that same level of religious leadership that's trying to combat it. I don't think that now I think there's a free reign to say, hey, go out here and, and do this work now. And I think that you're free to do so because you're not necessarily held under the law. You don't have these other repercussions that now have to come from it. Like I can't imagine he had to go somewhere and give a sacrifice and do, he didn't have to do all these same things that probably other people would have had, like the leper would have had to have done. Um, we're going to see about with the, the woman with the discharge, like she would have had to probably have done something because she was technically unclean. And so that, that I think that that's why this is such a, it's an interesting thing. It's like, how do I really wrestle with that? Because it doesn't say it plainly, but when you kind of dig more into it and kind of see like, okay, this is where this is. There's not as many stipulations. That means that there's a lot more freedom for this person. And so then what happened to him after? Yeah. And there's so many times I feel like in scripture where it's just like, so what happened after? We don't hear the rest of the story anymore for these people. And I mean, we just hope for the best, but if anything, they die for Christ. It's like, yeah, the yeah, it's <laughs> like you know, Hollywood made a movie and it was like, let's follow the demon because that's me. And that's mm -hmm. the name of the movie because like, we have to figure out what he did. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, Great. yeah, yeah. So, uh, so moving on to day two, um, we're still in chapter five. This is verses 21 to 43. 
And so they actually go back to the other side. So now they're back on the west side. This is more Jewish territory. And we'll, we see that right away because um, it talks about this uh, a synagogue ruler, um, Jairus, who has a daughter that's on the verge of death. Um, and he literally says the point of death. And so now we see even the word synagogue comes right back up immediately. So we see like it's, it's a shift in the type of culture and community that's there. And so for this guy to be a ruler, that's just saying that he was kind of like the head guy. So, you know, he would maybe be like the, the senior pastor or an executive pastor of the synagogue. He was kind of responsible for the day-to-day -day operations. Usually if somebody came in to speak, somebody invited them to speak, I wouldn't be surprised if he was one of those people that would invite somebody to come in to speak. And, um, and so this story is very opposite of, um, uh, at least in a sense of, he, he asked Jesus to lay hands on his daughter, which is opposite of the, there's a centurion servant that, that this was a, a healing before who, who had a servant that was ill and Jesus healed that servant without even going there. And in, in this time, this guy is saying, hey, come lay hands on her. So his faith was almost dependent upon an action that he could actually see versus in this other type of a healing, which Mark, I don't think covers in the centurion servant, but I think, I believe in Matthew it does, where Jesus wasn't even there. He did it from afar. And it goes into like their faith, which I'm going to share in a bit, why that's such a key part about Jesus not actually going there and, and what impact that had. But he was wanting him to come. And so all of a sudden there's a sharp change into a woman with a bloody discharge. And it's just like, what, what is going on here? Like, how are you just going to cut that off right, right away and go into this other thing? Now, they were on their way somewhere. So it's not like it's not realistic, but it was just like you just cut this story in the middle and then it picks back up after that. And so here's this woman with a blade discharge that's been 12 years. So she's basically been unclean for 12 years. She's been ostracized. So she's had a, a medical problem for this long. She's had a religious problem because she's unclean, which probably means she had a social problem. I'm sure she didn't have a lot of people associating with her, if any. And she had a financial problem because it said that she basically gave all that she had to doctors and stuff to fix her and her situation only got worse. It's one thing for your situation to maintain. It's another for it to get worse. And I think about, I know you're in healthcare, like diabetes or heart, heart cardiovascular disease. Some of these conditions is not necessarily going to get better, but how do we just maintain you so it doesn't get worse? In her situation, it didn't even maintain. It's just, it was getting worse. And I can only imagine like how discouraging that was. But here she goes in this crowd, Jesus is in the crowd, and I'm just mind boggling trying to picture if she's unclean, how will she even get, like how many people was she touching to try to get to him? Because it says she touched his garment, but how many other people were, did she bump into possibly that could now be considered unclean? And even with that, this is a, this is really like a, a private, a private issue because it's not like it's, it's leprosy where I can see it on your skin. Like, is this like an honor code almost now where it's just like, hey, you know, you're unclean. You need to live by that. Or are you are you going to just kind of be out and about or does something happen? Um, you know, I don't really know as far as like when it says she just had a consistent, um, like basically a blood discharge that was coming out. Like, I don't know what that means. Did it stop and start? Was it just literally a continuous like an IV drip? Like, it was, like, what did that even mean? But it must have been known to some degree because there was going to there was a political or not political. There was a public ridicule um, that came with that. And I think her story is just beautiful because she had a private issue with public ridicule. So Jesus, by her touching his garment, she her private issue was healed, but he redeemed her publicly. And so she felt, it says that she felt her body that she was healed of her disease. Nobody else can feel what she feels is her body. But by Jesus telling her, daughter, your faith has made you well, go in peace and heal of your disease. I don't even think that was for her. I think it was for everybody else that was around because they might've already known of her condition. And now he's saying that she's clean. So if she were to say that she was clean, now she's got another person saying that she's clean. So not only is it Jesus saying it, but she's also got a witness because in this time, like having a witness was a very big deal. Having another person that can vouch for you to say, hey, yes, this happened. No, this didn't happen. And here's somebody is now vouching for her. And so she had to build up courage for this. Um, it says, uh, when she said, um, for she had, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And this was as she was going up in to touch his garment. So she was probably very fearful, just even just being in this crowd, being in an awkward situation for her. 
man, I mean, is, it, is this going to work? Is this not going to work? Like there's probably so many things, but her faith made her well. And he's, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. And so it's just it's just a beautiful story and how all of that has just kind of come full circle. And I, I'm just trying to think really how she got there because I think about the paralytic. These men had to carry him onto a roof, open it up and bring him down. And somehow she got through the crowd to Jesus. And it's almost like, was she like, crawling even because she didn't want to be seen and, and and some of it say touch the hem of his garment which means it's more of on the bottom because they had certain tassels on the bottom like how did i'm just the level of faith that it took for her to do that was just amazing and and her faith made her well and so this whole story was probably it, it jesus doesn't say this to to um to the uh, synagogue ruler but this is encouragement for him hey we're about to go to your daughter that is dead or dying and here I just healed somebody who's had 12 years of an issue. And even just the similarities of the daughter's 12 years old, like, is that, are these things starting to click for him to say, okay, like there might be something to this. And so, um, so they finally get there and this is a whole situation. People now come in and they're like, Hey, um, you know, your daughter's dead. Why, why trouble this guy even further to come and help you? And it talks about how there was a, uh, there was a, a commotion that was going on. People were weeping and wailing. In Matthew, it actually says that there were flute players. And so uh, there were actually people who were professional like mourners, like they were like paid to come in and just to mourn. And this reminds me when my wife and I first moved to Dallas and we were watching, I don't know, this was a TV show. It was Golden Gate Funeral Home. And <laughs> I don't know, I don't know where it's at, but it's here in Dallas. And it's a TV show about a funeral home that does funerals and they have people on staff who get paid to go and mourn at the funerals and they would have different things they're like hey hit that tornado move real quick so like when they'd be in there the way they cry or the way they move around they way they move their hands like they it was like a, a game or something like that and so they were being they're being paid to actually do that and we know that this is a similar situation because immediately um it says in verse 40 and they laughed at him um when jesus was saying why are you making a commotion and weeping this child is not dead they laughed at him how are you going to go from weeping and mourning and playing somber music to now you laughing? Like, you know, there was no kind of connection that was going on whatsoever in this time. And so with that, Jesus said, look, y'all got to go. Like, we got to get y'all out of here so I can do what I do. And uh, in verse 37, it says how he allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John. And I think that this goes back to the eyewitness thing again. A lot of times, because if Jesus could have done something, it could have easily have been a he say, she say type of a situation. But now he has witnesses. Um, in, in the future, we'll see with the transfiguration, like he had these same men there. There's a witness. And so when you see in other scriptures, like Paul will talk about it, or in first and second, I think first Peter talks about eyewitnesses. Like they, it's not like, like I was there. It's not like there are eyewitnesses because when Luke wrote his gospel, he's saying, hey, there were eyewitnesses and I took information from them. This is like, no, these are eyewitnesses. They're actually present and they're going to witness this girl be brought back to life. Um, and that just goes back into the law about having to have a witness. And so um, so he goes in there. Um, he, he, he tells the girl to, to get up. Um, I say to you, arise. Immediately she gets up. She begins walking. Um, and immediately they were overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know of this. And he told them to give her something to eat. So we see he goes back to once again saying, hey, keep this on the hush. Don't tell anybody what just happened here. And she's OK. And that's because I think there's a safety concern that comes with that. And they're back in the Jewish area where hey, just don't you don't want that headache right now. You know, my time has not yet come. You don't want that headache because there's no way to really explain it. So just be happy that she's here and let's just keep it moving. And that's really what Jesus is telling him. So that's how we can kind of see from a geographic standpoint how those type of things have have changed over. <clears throat> um, so one of the questions I had were some like the similarities and the differences between um, Jairus's daughter and the woman with the discharge. What were some of the similarities that you guys saw between the two? They both were dying their own way. Mm -hmm. They both were seeking treatment for years. Yeah. You know, and, and had no hope in their children. They didn't see any light mm -hmm. coming from it. So nobody. 
it'd be very interesting to to know what the daughter's perspective was. I mean, here we see her father saying, hey, she's dying. I'm sure there's this, I can only imagine how he was feeling saying, hey, Jesus, come heal her. But while he was gone, and when they came back, well, I mean, I guess if she's dead, but up until that point, like, I don't think that she just dropped dead. If she's at the point of death, I'm assuming there was something that at least was going on that might have led to that. I'm just thinking, like, if you suffer for that long, it's like, it's like for 12 years, you know? mm -hmm. so if you suffer for that long, it's almost like when you know you're at that storm, you almost kind of give up, like you let go, and you're like, okay, well, it is what it is, and mm -hmm. I'm going to die. So I'm wondering if that's how she felt, mm -hmm. which is why she could pass away while her dad was trying to get up, mm -hmm. you know, from Jesus, you know? Mm -hmm. But she probably was like, it's a lost cause. Mm -hmm. By the time he comes back, this man ain't going to do anything wrong that none of the doctors have done. Yeah, because we don't even know how far they were. We just know they were on their way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think with, I mean, both of them being female, there's a healing that's needed. We get the 12 years in two different formats. Um, both of them are actually surrounded, because here she is in the crowd, the, the woman. In the dark, there's, there's people that are here now in this commotion. I think that there's, there are these things that this guy's saying, hey, there's some similarities that are going here. And okay, let me see what this guy is going to do. Um, but of course, like um, the, the differences that I saw were that the daughter was touched by Jesus, but the woman touched Jesus, or at least his garment. And so I think it, it goes to show that it, it goes both ways. Like we can reach out to Jesus, especially when I think about with prayer, like he's allowed that highway to open up for us to go directly to God. Like we can reach out to him and he reaches out to us at the same time. It's a relationship that's there. It's not just a one way type of a deal. And then um, uh, the, the daughter was essentially brought low for healing, if you will, um, in that uh, she was she, she was clearly probably laid down as, as, as she died. But this woman was kind of brought up in a sense that she was probably low touching this hem of his garment. And it was like, hey, your faith has made you look like, it's kind of like the pair of like stand up, like you are healed. And so I think that it, it kind of goes again where whether we are in a, a high position that goes low or if we're in a low position, we need to be like, like he's going to, Jesus is always going to work. He's always going to work through the details, whether we come to him, he comes to us. If we feel if it's a great day, if it's a bad day, he's still the same Jesus that we need. And I think that that's just great to see between these two stories. Um, is there anything else just from from both of these between uh, the two women and, and just kind of seeing this healing that that we know that you guys noticed or have any questions or comments on? I guess my goal is what you said about you touch the young girl. Mm -hmm. That's because she's a child. She needs kind of that extra help. But yeah, yeah. The same when you're, you know, an adult, that you should have the, the strength and the know how to, to reach out for help. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Something that's pretty, um, this is a little bit on a different topic, but that's pretty interesting about this particular week. Um, this chapter five and going through chapter six, um, if you were to read in Matthew, this is from chapters eight to 14. Now there are some things that Mark is a lot of times like the miracles and the healings Mark is more detailed than Luke and Matthew is, but they share more just information. And so we'll see, and actually in Mark, um, I believe it is, I believe it's this uh, the, the day one where we talked about the swine. That if you were to read it in Matthew, it actually came before some of the other events that we've already talked about. And so I don't necessarily think that Mark is a, a, a direct chronological event, chron chronology of events that have happened. I think it's just like he got everything secondhand and I'm putting it down because he wasn't an eyewitness. Peter was an eyewitness and Mark got his information from Peter and then he put it together. Matthew, who was an eyewitness, he's probably better suited to put things in more of a chronological order to do that. And so if, if you look at it, like I said, I think that the swine part is in like chapter chapter nine in Matthew, but Matthew doesn't get called to be a disciple until like, I think it's like chapter 12 um, in Matthew. And so we already saw that happen before. We've already passed that stage. And so I think this kind of goes into when people kind of want to think about the synoptic gospels and like they're, they're different. No, they're the same. It's just from a different lens. And you have to look at it from like a diamond, you know, with a diamond, it has different angles. And you even have 
you have cut, you have carrots, you have clarity. There's different things that make up a diamond. And so like Mark could be the clarity part of a diamond versus Luke is the cut part of a diamond versus Matthew is the, is the carrot part of the diamond. And you have to think of it from that perspective and say, hey, it's the same thing, but from a different perspective. Um, this is something that's even different, but in Revelation, when it gets into like all those different judgments and like the bowls and the seals and things, like some people believe like these are actually the same event, but from a different view. So if it's the seals, if it's the bowls, if it's the whatever it is, it's just from a different view. And one view might be like a church view. One view is from like a, a, um, those that are, for, are from God view, but it's of the same event. And so that's how we have to look at these different things. And so I, I know like it can seem a little bit um, daunting sometimes to be like, I mean, I'm already reading Mark. I don't want to have to go read something else. But you can get a lot more context sometimes by seeing, hey, where is this at? Especially if it's in one of the synoptics, where is that in there? And kind of like what happened? Because the flute, when I saw the flute player in Matthew, I was just like, wait a second, Mark didn't have that part in there. And you just see how much he's put, what, six chapters in two chapters. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things that just aren't going to be said. Um, so with um, the... Let's make sure. Okay, so with day three, um, we start in chapter six. Um, this is just a few verses. So uh, verses one through six, he went away from there and came to his hometown and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue and many who heard him were astonished saying, where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could not do mighty works there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief and he went back among the villages together. So he went back to his hometown. So now this is Nazareth. We know this is from chapter one, verse nine. That's Jesus' hometown is Nazareth. Nazareth. So he's here. And uh, on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. Jesus doing Jesus things. He's teaching, healing, and casting out demons. Like that's his, that's pretty much his trifecta that's going on. And he wants his, he's going to want his disciples to do the same thing um, pretty soon. But the people, once again, are still like, where does this man get this wisdom? Where does he get this authority to teach in this way? And they're now saying like, isn't this a carpenter? Like, this dude didn't go to seminary school or a Bible college somewhere. Like, this dude is just a builder. Like, who is he to come up in here and talk about these things? Or isn't he the son of Mary? And this was a, a direct insult because if you are normally going to name somebody, especially a son, it would be the son of in the father. So, like, whenever you think of, um, like, one of the disciples' name is Bartholomew, like, Bar just means son of. So, if you see, like, Simon Bar Jonah, which is Peter, like, Peter, so his dad's name was Jonah or Jonas, like, that's his, Bar Jonah just means that. And so, the real, to me, terminology was, for them to say son of Mary, it was an insult. Because now it's just like, oh yeah, this was that that virgin that we don't really know what was going on there because I don't think Joseph and Mary did anything, but somehow that's his son. I don't really know. And, and so it's now it's an insult to say he's a son of Mary, like as if there is no father. And um, and then the brother of James, so now that he's got, he's got brothers. Like if this is supposed to be the Messiah, how he got siblings, like that doesn't make any sense. And so this was just very just disrespectful. Um, but to be a carpenter, a carpenter is a builder, and we know that God is a creator. So to me, even for an earthly job, like that was very suitable for Jesus to do that. But they were just very disrespectful in that. Um, and so, um, and it says, are, and are not his sisters here with us? And so this is the first time that we hear about Jesus also having, having sisters as well. So he had a family. Um, and so they took offense to what he was doing because they're just like, come on, man, you can't teach, you just put, you know, you just put some flooring down in my house. Ain't no way you're going to come up in here and tell me about the law. Like, who are you? So they were just very disrespectful. So Jesus says a prophet is not without honor, um, except in his home, is not without, is not without honor, except in his hometown. And so I think this just goes, if, if, I don't know if you guys are, or if anyone is actually from the area, but if you ever are from somewhere and you leave and then you come back, and especially if you're not the same person, it's just like, no, like that, that's not you. That can't be you. So if I were to go back to Florida and I say, oh, I'm a pastor, they'd be like, absolutely not. Like, I don't believe that. And that's what's happening. They're like, no, like 
this you ain't a prophet like you're not anything you're just a carpenter that we knew your mama still lived down the street you know what i'm saying like that's that's what was going on your brother and them is still running the streets i'm seeing them here you're still the same guy and we're using your family actually to validate why you ain't changed even though you have changed i'm still seeing your family and they probably ain't changed so i'm gonna judge you based on them and we already know that there was a point where they were just like he's crazy we need to get him up out of here so they doubted him too so we can only imagine what type of gossip possibly could have been going on between people there and even the family. And so it starts to close out with, and he could do no mighty work. Um, he could not do a mighty work there, except he laid his hands on a few sick people and he marveled at their unbelief. Um, this word marvel is very important because there's only two times that the, that the scripture says that Jesus marveled. And both of those times were based on faith. This time he marveled at their lack of faith, their unbelief particularly because this was a Jewish crowd, they should have had the most faith of all people. The other time was when I mentioned the centurion servant that was healed and Jesus was not there. When he did it, their faith that he was going to do it was so big. Jesus was like, I haven't even seen faith like this in all of Israel. And so he had, he was marvel at a group who wasn't the chosen people whose faith was so strong. So the two times that Jesus marveled was both based on faith. One group should have had faith and they didn't. The other group shouldn't have had faith and they did. And that's what made him marvel. And so when I think about our lives today and the way that we carry ourselves and the faith that we can have knowing that God is going to cover us, like, man, what is it like to be like, oh, is Jesus marveling right now? Like, not, not, I don't want to make it like a pride thing, but like, we want to do our best to like, like, is that a question that we ask ourselves? Like, what would make Jesus marvel today? at what I'm doing in his name. And I think that's just like, that is that is just crazy. Like he marveled, this is Jesus, like the God man and he marveled. I mean, what, what, what else is, what is better than you? Like, you know, so it, it's, it's it, I think it just goes to show like how strong and how important this was for us to have um, faith. Um, so he went on to teach among the villages. So that just let you know he was really just kind of going around um, the town um, and just kind of doing his thing. So uh, let's see. Anything that you guys, I know this was a little bit shorter section than the other days. Um, is there anything from, from this particular section that you guys saw that kind of stood out to you, um, had some questions or just some other things that kind of popped up in Oh, yes. I was just going to say, it's just been interesting the last part where you know, like, he marveled, but then he just kind of goes on his way and, mm -hmm. and I don't know, comes back to it later on and tries to you know, bring them back to belief more. He's just like, you know what, I'm <laughs> going <laughs> gonna mm -hmm. try it. You, you don't have the respect for me. I'm just going to go and try and find the places that are not within his own mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Which, which, you know, for him to say he can't get it in his hometown, it's just like, he probably never went back. Like, can you imagine, like, I mean, I'm just thinking, let's just say here, and I mean, let's just, let's just use the Cowboys, and let's say Emmett Smith was still playing, and it's just like, like, this Emmett Smith, you know what I'm saying? Like, this is, this is supposed to be the guy, like, the cowboy of all cowboys, essentially, and, like, you're just not welcome here. Can you imagine, like, if he never wanted to come back here, like, People, you don't even play for the Cowboys no more. And people are just like, we're just glad that he lived here. Or Dion, you know what I'm saying? Like these type of, like, if you think of something like that, like the magnitude of what that means and to be like, well, I'll never want to go there. And I can imagine like, he was just like, I'm never going to go back. You had Jesus, the Messiah, and he never probably came back. You had him right in your grasp and you just let him go. So with um, on day four, um, this is uh, chapter six, verses seven through 13. Um, this is now kind of a calling or sending out of the 12. Um, it says, and, and he called the 12 and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except the staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if and if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. 
So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent and they cast out many demons and anointed with oil, many who were sick and healed. So this is now, I talked about a uh, when they went to the other side, like this fulfillment of them actually getting there. Here's now essentially in a, a fulfillment of when we talked about in Mark chapter three, verses 14 and 15, he called the 12 and he was in, he was going to send them out. He hadn't sent them out yet, but his plan was to send them out at some point in time with his authority to proclaim the good news, to heal and to cast out demons. And now it's happening. It's finally coming into fruition that he's sending them out to do those three specific things. And he sent them out two by two. So essentially we got six groups. And I think of this, when I was looking in Matthew, it lists them out. And uh, normally it, the list is fairly the same. You see normally like the brothers are together or there's two people together. And so I kind of think that Peter and Andrew probably went together. James and John probably went together. Philip and Bartholomew probably went together or Nathaniel and, and what his name is in John. Thomas and Matthew probably went together. James and Thaddeus, um, who's also named Judas, went together. And then Simon the Zealot and Judas maybe went together. Like I, I, there's typically a normal order as to how the disciples are listed. And normally they're put in pairs. And even in even in the text, it, it has like, after whenever it names the two people, there's like a semicolon. So you'll see like a comma between two names and you'll see a semicolon between these two names. So this is like I said, this is kind of like, my 25% theology, is it right? Is it not right? Kind of a deal. But like, I can imagine they were probably sent out in these groups in that way um, at this time to do what Jesus asked them to do. And so he told them basically to be humble. Hey, um, just, you have a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in your belts, but wear sandals and, and, uh, and don't put on two tunics. And so um, really he was just saying like, Hey, what are you wearing right now? Go with that. Don't, don't, don't take any extra luggage. Don't take any money. Be faithful. We just talked about unbelief. Hey, have belief in knowing that God is going to cover you in this journey. And this was actually essentially an attire of what a rabbi would have that went into the synagogue. They would wear, they had shoes at this time. I think we talked about this before. Excuse me. They had shoes, but then they had sandals. Just like we got shoes and sandals. If you wear sandals, that's like a that's like a, a representation of humility. Versus if you have shoes, like now that's a luxury. It's kind of like your feet are covered up. <clears throat> but also um, to uh, to to not have like on two tunics. So once again, not having on two shirts, just having on one shirt. Um, you can have like a staff, but sometimes they had two staffs when they would walk. One staff would just kind of be like a walking staff. Another staff could be kind of like a defense against if something were to attack them. And he's like, look, just take these hands, whatever can fit in your hands, just take that and that's all that you can get. And so it was really just a sense of uh, humility that was, that was happening there. And whenever you stay in a the house there until you depart, um, whenever you stay in a house, stay there until you depart from there. Um, in Matthew, it talks about inquire about a house that is worthy. And I thought that was very interesting. And I feel like this could go several different ways, but really I'm thinking that it's just, who's just really ready to accept you? You're coming here with a pretty crazy message. You're talking about Jesus here, the Messiah, and you're, or you're casting out, you're doing all these different things. And some people are going to be like, no, you can't stay here talking like that. And so, so I think this, this inquire about who is worthy, like, I think it's just, you're going to just be meeting people because what rabbi, they would actually go house to house when they were actually raising support for their ministry and they wouldn't stay with someone. So for Jesus to tell them to actually stay and live with someone, set up shop somewhere was actually foreign. It wasn't what the normal culture would do. And so he's telling them to do something that's different. Um, and so if they receive you, they'll listen to you. But then he says, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. Th he's telling them, to, hey, if they don't believe what you're telling about the good news, then, hey, you, 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 you can't worry about that anymore. You did what you had to do. Keep it moving. But this is another cultural reference, because whenever a Jewish person would go to a Gentile region, they would actually dust off their feet when they would leave because that area was considered unclean. So I think something that's really cool about this verse is that they actually just did this because they just left from a Gentile region and came back to the West side where they healed the, where Jesus healed the woman with the discharge and everything. And so they just actually did this literally in the, in the bodily sense. And now he's telling them in a more of a spiritual sense or a more of a, a receptive, like, Hey, if they don't want to listen to your message, just keep it moving. Um, and so I thought that was just really cool. And I feel like, Jesus has been setting them up for this. 
all of this time they had been in a in a in a Jewish Jewish land. He took them over to the Gentile land. Hey, let me kind of show you the other side of the coin here. I want to make sure you can see everything that you possibly will come across. Now we're going to come back and I'm going to send you out. Because in this, if you read it in Matthew, Jesus tells him specifically to only go to Jewish lands. He doesn't tell them to go into Gentile lands. He says, go to the people where Israel is first. Now, that doesn't mean that there couldn't be Gentile people in those areas, but he told them to not go into those areas. And that's just a direct reflection of Acts 1-8, where it talks about you receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you'll basically share the, share the gospel in uh, Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Well, if you read through the book of Acts, the apostles stay in Jerusalem. And then you have Paul and other missionaries who come in and they do Judea and Samaria. And then everybody else that comes after, such as us, is supposed to go to the ends of the earth. So this is a very orderly thing that's happening here to say, hey, you just go to the Jewish people right now. It's not time to go to the Gentiles. I know you saw me do it. I just want to give you a little bit of a taste of what's to come. And as you guys are now probably making disciples, they're going to be able to replicate and do those things for those people also. And so they went out and proclaimed that people should repent, cast out many demons, and anointed many with oil. So those are the three things that Jesus did, and now they're doing those three things. And anointed with oil is, oil was used for like medicine. So this was an actual practice that happened, but it's also a depiction um, of really the uh, pouring out of the Holy Spirit. Like, hey, if you're praying over somebody, you anoint them with oil, you're trying to just cover them. And so, so that's what he's telling them to do. And so many were sick and they were healed uh, in this time. So um, now they're, they've kind of been under Jesus. Um, they've learned under him. They've followed him. They've asked questions and things like that. And now it's like, hey, it's time to do the work. Because verse 12 says, so they went out. It's time to do the work. Because Jesus told them to go out, but they still had to actually go do it. And so they actually started to do the work. Um, I think that one of the questions for this week was, and we've talked about the words authority and proclaim a lot. So the question was, here we see authority and proclaim once again. How do you think these concepts are so important in this book? And I think for us, so for our church, our, our values are bold faith, unconditional love, servant leadership, and kingdom multiplication. And I think that those four things actually represent those two here. When I think of authority, I think of servant leadership, and I think of unconditional love. When I think of proclaiming something or preaching, I think of having bold faith in kingdom multiplication. You want to make more and better followers of Jesus. And so I think that this is, what, at least for me, this is why this is important. Because for us as a church, like we have values, but these values have to come from Jesus. And these are things that Jesus did. He showed servant leadership. He had unconditional love. He had both faith and he multiplied people in the kingdom. And then he told them to go and do the same thing, to act in the same way. Uh, how do you guys feel about just this authority now being fully transferred over and then proclaiming? I mean, what do you feel like just as a, I feel like as a believer, like there's a sense of conviction now, like, oh, I got a job to do now. Like I got this level of, of authority. I, I've been raised up and now I have to go do this. And if I don't do my job, like I'm going to be fired. Like what's going, what, what happens with that? I think as Christians, like you know, we we take comfort in the fact that we would follow Christ, right? Mm -hmm. But not realizing how much authority they all give us. Um, he's given to faith to rule pretty much mm -hmm. over you know, control, over anything that is evil and whatnot. And those are things that as children you are afraid of. You know, you grow up in fear because you're like, oh, look at me, whatever. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. Not realizing that we have the authority over them because. It's that simple. Like God gave it to us, mm -hmm. you know, but it's not that we take it for granted, but we don't really think about the significance of um, the fact that he trusted us to have that thing, yeah. you know, and we're not just mere children of God that follow him. We're called to do more. Mm -hmm. We're called to, to proclaim, to preach. You know, we're called to heal. We're called to to a, like you said, a higher calling, mm -hmm. but not realizing what that gravity really is. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's where we're, that's glory. Mm -hmm. You talk about, you know, having a higher calling and being, we have to do these things. And not that we need to be legalistic or it's like it's just a checklist situation, but we're supposed to do these things. And there is a weight, there is a gravity. 
And when you think about weight and gravity, like that's what glory is. So when I think about, I've just really been brought low lately, but in a good way, because it's just like, if I'm feeling this weight to do these things, like what does God feel? Because I'm just one person on earth doing it within this little B sphere of influence. And he's doing it for all creation. Like, how can you not bow down to that? Like, that's just like amazing to think about it in that way. That's what I think about when you look at that authority back to what you're saying is that I don't, I believe most, you know, people just in general, we look at people, everybody, they don't believe they even have that, that they have anything. Mm -hmm. So it, it's almost like the enlightenment of realizing who your father is and you go, wow, I have that. You know, I, I can reflect on talking to my son just last week and let me know I'm, and, and I, I remember what I said but it was funny because it wasn't me talking and I was like oh what did, what did I just say but I, I remember the one thing because I think God was ministering to me at the same time and I remember the words he was just like remember who my father is mm -hmm. and I said you know in God when you did me and when you must have gave your father to give you and I just mm -hmm. went oh Mike I think I just said something and I, I said I think God is telling me something right now too remember who my father is Mm -hmm. And I said, so for you, I think in that it's almost the enlightenment that people get like, wow, I actually have this story. I can say, you know, devil will be born. I can say there's no such thing for boogeyman or ghosts or this or that. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And if it is, guess what? Hey, I have God. I mean, I don't know yeah. what you talk. But I think so many people don't even realize they have any authority. So because of that, they just mm -hmm. they just live. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Pastors and somebody else pastors. thinking somebody else is going to carry through. I think like that there's so many of them are still trying to yeah. figure it out, but also go, man, can be. Can be. No, but talk about, I mean, yeah, the pastor can be. I mean, he got it. Uh -huh. I don't know how he got it. You know, he must just have something else, right? Or, but if he does it for me and he prays, that's good. Okay, good. I'm glad he covered me because mm. I needed him to cover me because mm -hmm. I couldn't have done it myself. Or and it's only gonna last like this. Or I'm not walk out the house yeah. the church and go on because he only covered me so long. Because he probably covered a whole lot of other people too. So <laughs> I mean, it's just you know, it's just not you know, counts and everything. That's how the Yeah, they saw it. That doesn't necessarily mean they believed it. Yep. You know, they knew the works of God. But that doesn't mean that they believe in the works of God, that it yeah. was there. When Jesus cast out the demons, you know, we if you look at it from their perspective, from the crowd, they could look at it like he created one human for another because they mm -hmm. believed that Jesus was not doing mm -hmm. things of God. Mm -hmm. So they believe he came from the dead. So mm -hmm. it could have been like, okay, well, you just took out one of the demons yeah. from another one. You took out one of your friends and then he yeah. contained them. In whatever, we don't know if it's power or not. Maybe you're doing it because we're going to come yeah. back and do some other stuff later. Yeah. You know, but all those questions and all those beliefs yeah. come out of fear, right? And that's what they were. They were fearful of not following the law and being one who's left behind, yeah. but at the same time, not realizing that it made them all stay in the right place. And when, and when Jesus was in his hometown, it talked about how he only healed a few. And it's because, because we talked about this before, where all people came to the house, but he only, he healed many, but not all. Mm -hmm. It was because there was an unbelief that's there. If there's, un, like, I won't say there's only so much he can do, but in a sense, like, we still have to do our part. Like, we still have to come into this. And and there was an unbelief that was there that he just, he did heal everybody because of their unbelief. Yeah, you can't help everyone. You can't help someone who doesn't want to be helped. Yeah. And if their pride is in the way, because... They believe what they believe. It becomes prideful, mm -hmm. you know, and pride is no fault. Yeah. Right? So God's saying, I can't heal you. And not until you knock that pride right out. If you knock that pride right out and start believing, I can do stuff. But if not, you are putting a wall on the demons, yep. you know, that I can't work with. Yeah. And Tanil had shared, um, is it was this this with authority and proclaim, like this understanding um your power and purpose. And so John. 2021 talks about how the father sent Jesus so then he could send basically to send disciples like so that this power I don't want to call it like it's a transfer of, of energy and think of like his you know his deity but there's this transfer of like the father sent Jesus to send us then to send other people like if we talk if we talk about uh, uh, sin, how sin came from Adam and Eve introduced into the world and has carried on all of these generations. Now that Jesus has come, this same authority has now, it's now here. Like as, as, as a follower of Jesus, we now have this, the father gave it to him to give to us 
to now to give to somebody else and to continue on. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I think that that is a hard thing to grasp for somebody, especially if it's just like, I don't know about that. And mm -hmm. if you're, especially if you're surrounded with other people who are saying that, I mean, if it's, they're saying the same thing, it's just, it's going to be hard. Um, but that's where that, I think at least if you are asking the questions, if you are at least just curious, um, you know, it's not that you can't be doubtful, mm -hmm. but like, do you stay there? Are you not kind of growing from that? And so, you know, I think that's just, how do we continue to grow um, from that some more? Uh, so day five, um, the last day, this is, um, it's kind of a transition now because we have uh, King Herod, um, who is basically having a, uh, he has a birthday party. Um, he's talking about, he's hearing about Jesus and the things that Jesus is doing. And, you know, people are saying like, is this Elijah? Um, this comes from Malachi 4 or 5, where they're thinking like, hey, um, he's going to come back. So it's, it's basically when Elijah was picked up in a whirlwind, is this him now coming back? And uh, then when he says he's a prophet, like one of the prophets of old, uh, Moses talked about in Deuteronomy, where there's going to be another one like me that's going to come. And so people are wondering, like, is this Elijah? Is this a prophet? King Herod thinks that this is John the Baptist coming back from the dead, um, which isn't the case. And so it goes on to now there's a there's a party in in this party they they be, it's a recollection of John. We haven't heard for, about John the Baptist in a while. We heard about him early on, like in chapter one. We haven't really heard about him anymore. And this is kind of revisiting what happened to him. So it, it talks about how he was beheaded um, at this at this party, but he was in jail. And he was in jail because he told Herod, he was like, hey, man, you just married your brother's sister. Like, that's against the law. Like, Leviticus actually says you cannot do that. And he did it. And Herod was just mad. He was in his feelings. He was just like, you so you going to tell me I, I, who I can and can't marry? I know what the law, but honestly, he's probably like, I don't even follow the law like you. Like, he's not even necessarily a, a Jew in this sense. But John is still holding him to the same standard. And um, something I, I read that was interesting was it says King Herod, but like he wasn't, it says that he wasn't even really a king. He was more of a, uh, like a governor of an area. And that um, some people would maybe call him king just because of the family, the family line. But, but Rome had an empire that was actually in charge. And Herod was just kind of like a, a minion under them who was running over a certain area of land. So he probably just kind of puffed himself up with just like, well, I'm a king because I am, I'm the governor, you know, I'm running this area. So I'm going to just take that title. And so he had a party for his birthday. Um, his, his, his daughter um, or wife's daughter, I don't even know if this is his actual kid or not, but he had her come and dance in front of people, which is sounds like a whole other issue in itself. And, um, and so he said, hey, what do you do? Because at this time in the culture, they would have women that would come in and they would dance and they would be like, okay, what do you want as a form of payment? And so he was messing around just like, hey, I'll give you half of my, half of my kingdom, which he didn't really have a kingdom in a sense because he don't run anything. Um, but he was saying, what do you want? And I thought it was interesting because this daughter, even though he's probably exaggerating saying you can have half up to half of my kingdom, she was like, well, I just want John the Baptist head on the flat. And it's just like, mm, that's what you asked for? And so that's what makes me believe that there's some kind of a conspiracy that was going on with the mom because she went to her asked, if he said, what do you want? Why would you go to somebody else and say, well, what do you want? And then I'm gonna come back. Like there clearly had to be have been something that was gonna go on there. And we already knew that um, Herodias, the wife was probably already upset at what John was doing. She was, and I'm, you know, how society is. The guys don't always get as bad of a rap as the women do. And I'm sure she was just like, no, nah, bro, we're not about to do that today. That's just not gonna happen. And so, so that's what she wanted. And so, um, so what happened? So they, they killed him and it's, it talks about how Herod was really, um, he was grieved essentially in this time in verse 26, it says the king was exceedingly sorry, but the, the, the Greek of this, like the root word, this same grief is the same grief that when, and we'll get to this in Mark 14, when Jesus told Peter and the disciples to stand watch while he went to go pray. He came back and he was saying that I'm grieving for what's to come. Mm -hmm. Like it, this is it's the same word. So if like if Jesus knows he's about to be crucified, like there's a level of grief that's there, and this is saying that Herod had that level of grief. So as probably as two faced as he was, the things that he was doing, he was still a person at the end of the day, and he had feelings. 
And as much as John did all these different things, he was still kind of like, some of the things he says is pretty good, you know? Um, and it also said that he feared him. So I, I yeah, yeah. if he was like, well, hold up a second. What if he really was this and that? And, mm -hmm. you know, when he born, you know, it's like, hey, Jesus, this boy, oh, mm -hmm. man, I'm in trouble. You know, this boy, mm -hmm. get, you know, he probably yeah. had some. Especially if he think he came back from the dead. Like, then he's like, oh, wait a second now. Like, <laughs> we'll come back with new Jesus. <laughs> yeah. So, so it, this this level of grief that he had, I think that's it's it's pretty cool to see like this this that side of him because any other time you hear about a Herod in here, like I, we mentioned before, how um, Herod the Great initially was trying to kill Jesus when he was a baby, mm -hmm. but then you have his son Herod who's trying to keep, who essentially sends Jesus to Pilate to die as an adult. So this whole family has been like basically responsible for Jesus' death since the very beginning since he was born. And you have a, yeah, and they're from the same line. Like, it all go back to Abraham at the end of the day. Yeah. But there's a level of grief that comes in about with John the Baptist, who was the forerunner of Jesus. So I think that there's there's a little bit with that. And I think that even reminds me of uh, Judas. Like, after he did what he did, like, he even had a moment where he, I think he killed himself. He's just like, I can't take this anymore. Like, this is just too much weight for me to handle. And so there's a level of uh, humility that has, has come. But, you know, that's where they're at with it. So, um so we know why John was beheaded. Um, are, are there anything that kind of just stuck out? I know we're kind of we're running out of time here, but um, what from this specific passage? I always think this is interesting because it's a it's a recollection of something that already happened in the past. But what are some things that kind of stood out to you guys in in this particular passage? Just how much hate that someone can hate. You know, that's mm -hmm. to kill someone or behead someone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You have to not care at all and literally almost in, like excitement and it, you know almost like a like a like a psychotic way like mm -hmm. you know it's just not natural to sit there yeah. and say yeah go ahead and try to tell it you know yeah you know I think about when you hear on the news if somebody shot somebody stabbed somebody especially if it's like a multiple time it's just like what do you be what do you got to be thinking to especially like I feel like I'm not saying this is better but like if you shoot somebody, like if you're not there, but if you stab, like you have to be like there. You have to be like touching this person in a sense. And it's just like Well, that's what I'm saying. So I mean I come from my family's third world country in front of you and stuff, but like when that whole thing and when you talk more about the eighties and the nineties when the Taliban and all this mm -hmm. stuff, and stuff and I remember one time it was actually televised where they videotaped beheading a, a, a soldier and I was like how do you sit there and mm -hmm. do that and and I mean people think they didn't turn it to me but how do you sit there and watch it and I'm like because I'm in awe of how someone can actually sit there and and I mean to cut someone's head off you're hearing veins pop you know you're hearing all that mm -hmm. it makes you cringe just thinking about it yeah and when you're watching and hearing it well how do you just take pleasure in that like mm -hmm. you have to be so evil minded to and be literally taken over by Satan to be able to physically do that without getting sick yourself. Yeah. And I think I think to do it when you you mentioned about how can you watch it, right. I think there's a level of that's that being in the world and of the world. Yes. I have to know what's going on mm -hmm. to know where do people need to be reached. Like you can't just totally close yourself off and just not because then where does it stop? Okay, if I can't watch that, then I can't watch. Well, then what are you going to, you just never watch TV because there's always something on TV now. Like, at what point does it stop? I think there's a level of, it's just the heart from it. Like, are you um, watching it because you enjoy seeing it? Like, that's a completely different posture than if you're just like, wait a second, this is what's going on. Like, you think about the Ukraine, that's what's going on. Oh, no. How do we help? Like, how do we, how do we fix this? So there's a different posture, I think, that goes with that. And I would, to me, that would be my response to that kind of a question. Yeah. So, I mean, and that's the thing to sit there and for the person to request for beheading to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's already bad. But then to sit there as a crowd to watch it happen. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm sure some people were like, is it really happening? Like, I yeah, can't yeah. believe I'm actually watching this. And other people are partying, you know, watching it. So you kind of move it up the road. The government was. Mm -hmm. You definitely know, had culture too. I mean, you definitely know, had history and all that. Back. I mean, because that was, I won't say it was normal. It's still but you got so. I, I, it does, but I don't know if it 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 probably takes. We're we're I, 
my own opinion. I think we're so sensitive now about stuff like that, that that's a whole food. Back then, uh, them stabbing somebody was probably like, oh, so once we just got cut, <laughs> you know, it wasn't like, we're like, oh, I think, yeah. So I think back then it was, it was just yeah, more yeah. so, yeah, it was more so like, hey, you know what, this, this is about to happen. I, I really think, I mean, they probably was crazy, but they probably like, man, they about to go down over there. People were running like, let's go see they fight me. You know, they about to fight. It wasn't like now kids going around like, fight, fight, fight. You know, mm -hmm. it was like they going around there, somebody about to die today. You know, and you had the person you buried and sitting over like. <laughs> Yeah. You know, it wasn't like now. Okay. I just think it was a little different. Yeah. You made a good point, Nancy, about like Jesus being crucified wasn't a new thing. Like that was a very common practice that they did. It wasn't new. Yeah. But it's the fact that it was Jesus and the magnitude that came with it is what changed history. Yeah. But the actual act of itself, like it wasn't new. I mean, clearly there was other there was two guys with him. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like it wasn't a new thing. So um, so yeah, so. Uh, that's man that's week five um we'll be back next week uh finishing week chapter six and getting into chapter seven um uh, it's 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 exciting now this shift and seeing the disciples now they're coming into play and taking things out and we'll continue to see that that multiply um with more and more people um coming in and having authority as we were talking about so um any, any last comments or anybody online any last comments or questions just about kind of like this week's lesson and I'm lovely to hear any feedback from just kind of how it's been going just so far for the past few weeks. It's just getting good. Yeah, it's getting really, <laughs> really quick, like real quick too. So mm -hmm. it's not mm -hmm. like you're gradually getting into it. It's bam, let's let's get into it. Isn't it yeah, so yeah, it's a lot. I feel like it's it's really pushing into it, which I like mm -hmm. because it is like you said, it's the yeah. perspective. Because when you read the other books, it's not as um, it's detailed, but it's not as detailed. Yeah. Yeah. Because, like I said, Mark is the the main focus of Mark is on what Jesus did. Like I said, Luke is a lot of what Jesus said. Mark is a lot of what Jesus did. Yeah. And so the miracles and the healings have a lot more heightened information. Because you'll you'll read in Matthew, you will talk about a woman had a bloody discharge. She touched the garment and she was healed. And it was like I get one verse. Like that's all that you did. Yeah. But then when you read Mark. Jesus was baptized in the sun well pleased. And you'd be like, that was it? Like Matthew goes a whole, like a whole chapter pretty much on that. So it's interesting to see the different perspective on what's like important for this specific thing to know about. And so um, so yeah, so I'm just, I'm just ecstatic about it. I love, I love doing this. Um, so I'll pray us out. Thank you all for joining and sticking over for a little bit longer. Um, appreciate y'all. Father, thank you for um, just another great lesson today. Thank you for just your word, allowing us just to have the freedom to be able to open the book, to read it, um, to, to talk about it and openly and freely. Um, we're just grateful for you and son Jesus, just, um, just for what you did to come down to just dwell among us, to be with us, um, to die for us so that we can live forever. And we're just so grateful um, for you, Jesus, grateful for you for resurrecting, for, for defeating death so that we know that we have a place in eternity, no matter what happens here on earth. And as we just continue to watch you, Jesus, watch what you watch your ministry, watch how you engage with people and the people that you touch and that reached out to you, the way that you talk to them and, and allow us to just to model your behavior, allow us to model the way that you are so that we can be more like you and the world can see that um, because we're in a world that is just. Um, full of darkness, allow us to be that light, allow us to put it on a lampstand and not under a table. Um, so we're just grateful. We're thankful for this. I'm thankful for your glory, God, allowing us just to even get an inkling of what that feels like in our personal lives and how we can carry out the mission um, further. We pray all these things in your son, Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Thank y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah.